Hi, everybody. I'm Jules. And I'm Joe. And this is True Crime and Headlines. Bonus. Coach. Three. This is of the Bonnie and Clyde series. So this is a bonus um, analysis episode. So if you've not listened to part one and two, make sure you go back and do so. We're going to be talking about Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow before they were the Bonnie and Clyde Duro, because we really want to dig in and figure out the why, how they came to be Bonnie and Clyde duo. And we need to look into who they were individually and in their background. So are you ready, Joe? Let's do it. All right. We are a production of Anley Audio House. That is a women-owned company. Woo! Woo! All right. Girl power. And we are more than pleased to be the owners of it. (laughs) So here we are with our first production of the bonus episode. There we go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, her. Bonnie Parker. She was born to Charles and Emma Parker, and she was the middle child of three. They lived in a small Texas town called Rowena, population 600, which is about as mid-Texas, I think, as you can get, like, geographically. Her father was a bricklayer, but when Bonnie was just four years old, he sadly died. And so her mother, Emma, was left widowed with three children and no source of income. So they moved to the industrial town, Cement City, which is a suburb in West Dallas. And they ended up moving in with Bonnie's maternal grandparents. And ultimately, they stayed there throughout the rest of her childhood. And Bonnie's brother was Buster. And younger sister was Billy. (laughs) All these bees. (laughs) But it was her cousin who also lived with their grandmother, whom Bonnie bonded with, Bess. (laughs) Bess was just three years older, and she also had a mischievous and curious streak just like Bonnie. It was actually really common for the two of them to join forces and cause trouble. So in his book, The Strange History of Bonnie and Clyde, author John Trahune retells of a time Bonnie and Bess lured two girls they accused of stealing pencils into a parking lot and beat them up. (laughs) So... The girls returned with their older brother, where in turn, Bonnie and Bess also beat him up. (laughs) So, and you know, it was reported that after that, there was no more pencil stealing. Okay. And then there's another story I want to tell you. So I think this one helps paint a little bit better picture of Bonnie. In elementary school, Bonnie had a crush on a boy named Noel. Noel had the misfortune of apparently pissing Bonnie off. So what did she do? She followed him after school and attacked him, not only hitting and scratching, but also with a razor blade while threatening to slit his throat if he ever bothered her again. (laughs) It took multiple adult passers-by to pull Bonnie off of this kid. So on the flip side, Bonnie was also known for being intensely tender-hearted. She loved her mother fiercely and She was also known for her love of children, and Bonnie's mother once returned home to find that Bonnie and her sister Billy had borrowed, (laughs) is this a tongue twister? Neighborhood babies. (laughs) It is. And kept them at her house for a child ice cream party. Oh. (laughs) Jody, she kidnapped freaking children. She She can watch my kids. She kidnapped the children. She would be such a good babysitter. She would be such a good babysitter. Babysitter Bonnie. People are like, hold on, sir. (laughs) I hope that people can start to understand your humor because going into this, knowing you're a psychiatric (laughs) practitioner. I left my firstborn with you (laughs) when I went to work because I didn't have any childcare. I knew her for like a week. (laughs) Can you watch my child? I guess. I pulled up to this old farmhouse, this 1800s house (laughs) with dogs and cats and donkeys and horses. And I left my child there. Can you tell them how my husband answered the door one day? <laughs> one day when I went to pick her up, John Dad, you'll get to know John Dad, answers the door in his underwear. <laughs> Jill was out running errands. And I was so awkward. I didn't know what to do. I like, quickly <laughs> gathered my things and my child. Here's my kid. <laughs> Bye. She's safe. I ensure you she was safe. Oh, my gosh. You know, he still defends that choice 
that those are shorts. I'm pretty sure after that I told is never mind, I can't say that because <laughs> husband's listening. I'm pretty sure after that's what I said. He's a nice ass. <laughs> Erase that. Or KK. I have to kiss it all the time <laughs> just to make up for all the bills. Uh. Okay. <laughs> that was not a wise decision. But here so we are. So when I first brought John, okay, we have to tell the story real fast because it's a bonus episode. When I first jo- brought John home, I had, you know, before like brought like boys kind of home. And here's John, like this full beard and everything. And mom made us sleep in separate bedrooms. And he woke up before me and went downstairs. And of course, I slept <laughs> in. And then he, <laughs> I come down. And I'm like, where's, where's this guy? <laughs> I didn't even know him that well. Where, where's John? And my dad said, I think he's in the backyard reading. And I look out and John's in his underwear, nothing else, on a lawn chair, drinking coffee and reading a book. <laughs> and my mom said, can you tell your special friend to put some clothes on? <laughs> didn't she also say, Julie? That's not a boy. That's a man. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell your special friend to put some clothes? Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Okay. <sighs> in in summation, boxer shorts are not shorts. Here we go. Bonnie kidnapped kids, and her mother promptly demanded, "Hey, Bonnie, please." return these children to their respective parents. Thank you so much. So here's something not many people are aware of is that Bonnie Parker was what we need to accurately describe as a child bride. And she was just 15 when she wed her husband. 15. Yeah. I mean, you can't get around it. That's a child. Um, What was the average age of marriage back then? uh, Let's see. In the 1930s, it looks like it was 21. Wow. 15 is really young. Yeah. Where was her husband during all this? The average age today is 27. So her husband, Rory Thornton, he was just a few years older than her. He was still in high school when they got married, too. And he ended up dropping out as well. And it turns out that he just wasn't around very often. He would disappear and run off. And um, he did petty crimes as well. And I do believe he was in jail for a stint. And um, she stayed with him. Her mom tried to convince her to leave him, but she thought, why? What's the point? I don't want to be married to anyone else. I don't uh, see a point in divorcing him. Just I'll just stay married to him. Well, turns out Roy ends up being gone for a year. And when he comes back, that's when she realizes, hey, you know, I don't think I want to be with this guy anymore. He comes back. He's like, sup, girl? And she says, no, like, we're good. We're done. So they did actually separate at that time, and she never sees him again. And what's interesting is he actually gets killed trying to escape prison. Oh, wow. Like four-something years after Bonnie's killed. Yeah. So he gets killed on a prison escape as well. Um, So here's what we know about their marriage. You know, he was rumored to be unfaithful to her. There's no confirmation, but he was a good-looking guy. He was always gone. Um, and he was just known to run off with other women and have mistresses. And she loved him so much that she got his name tattooed right above her knee. So <laughs> above her right knee, she has a heart. She had a heart tattoo that said Roy and Bonnie plus Bonnie. And what I found interesting. So cute. <laughs> plays right into this cute little image of Bonnie. That's adorable. Is it adorable? It is actually. interesting. And, you know, she left behind a journal. And this journal gives us an interesting look into who she was before she was Bonnie and Clyde. And I have a very talented actress that I asked to read entries from her journal. So this comes from the book Fugitives, the story of Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker. And it's actually <laughs> it's actually written by uh, Bonnie's mom and Clyde's sister. So they published some of Bonnie's a diary entry. So we'll go ahead and listen to these words from Bonnie herself. Here we go. Dear Diary, Before opening this year's diary, I wish to tell you that I have a roaming husband with a roaming mind. We are separated again for the third and last time. The first time, August 9 through 19, 1927, 
and the second time, October 1st through 19, 1927, and the third time, December 5th, 1927. I love him very much. I miss him terribly. But I intend doing my duty. I am not going to take him back. I am running around with Rosa Mary Judy, and she is somewhat of a consolation to me. We have resolved this New Year's to take no men or nothing seriously. Let all men go to hell. But we are not going to sit back and let the world sweep by us. January 1st, 1928. New Year's night. Twelve o'clock and the bells are ringing. The old year has gone and my heart has gone with it. I have been the happiest and most miserable woman this last year. I wish the old year would have taken my past with it. I mean all my memories. But I can't forget Roy. I'm very blue tonight. No word from him. I feel he has gone for good. This is New Year's Day, January 1st. I went to a show. Saw Ken Maynard in the Overland stage. I'm very blue. Well, I must confess, this New Year's night I got drunk. Trying to forget. Drowning my sorrows in bottled hell. January 2nd, 1928. Met Rosa Marie today, and we went to a show. Saw Ronald Coleman and Vilma Bank in A Night of Love. Sure was a good show. Saw Scotty and gave him the air. He's a pain in the neck to me. Came home at 5.30. Went to bed at 10.30. Sure am lonesome. So... Bonnie, at 19, finds herself separated from her husband. And so she begins working part-time at this local cafe as a waitress. Now, one of the patrons that comes to this diner is actually one of the police officers who later ends up being one of the six men at the ambush that shoot and kill her. Interesting. And yeah, it was interesting because it. Uh, he goes on to say that he didn't take pride or any joy in killing her. And when he looked at her in the car after, you know, she had been shot, she was slumped over and he could recognize the hand of the petite waitress that had once served him coffee at this cafe because it was right next to the police department. So she used to serve a ton of these police officers hmm. uh, four years prior to her death. I thought that was really interesting. Those full so circle. we know that dad was a bricklayer that lost his job during the Great Depression. They likely didn't have much money, went to live with grandparents. But we don't know about it. There's no concrete evidence of specific childhood trauma that she endured outside of of those things. No Physical abuse. Um, no, she was very beloved by her father as well. She she was able to get away with a lot of stuff uh, before his passing that, you know, her other siblings were, <laughs> were not able to. She was one of the favorites. I would say just the, the common trauma from the Great Depression in yeah. that time and then just losing your father. Yeah. As well. Kind of thinking about the attachment piece and how that plays into – life later on, you've got kind of this term called trauma repetition. And so essentially what you're doing is you're unconsciously repeating early trauma. And I'm just kind of applying it to her or her romantic relationships than anything. Whereas she was married at 15. Why? Why did she get married that young? That was an unhealthy relationship um, where he was kind of in and out and then goes on to this relationship with Clyde that clearly is not healthy either. Um, there's no like named abuse between the two, but I would guess that this is very much a trauma bond, which usually comes from a an abuser on one side um, of the relationship. And I'm wondering if there's any trauma repetition going there in terms of with trauma repetition, you try and subconsciously reenact earlier traumas in effort to kind of master it. So I'm wondering if that plays in at all into her relationship with Clyde. And also, again, there are no named abuse between Clyde and Bonnie, but I would have a hard time believing that that was not a trauma bond. Yeah, I, I agree. And we would talk about in, in part two that Blanche witnessed really explosive fights 
between Bonnie and yeah, Clyde, where she would yeah. run out into a cornfield and he would run out and chase her and she'd yep. be kicking and screaming. And he'd throw her over her shoulder and carry her back to the car and then they'd make up. Just like a toxic cycle. That's a definition basically of a trauma bond. So her waitressing job is actually what brings her connection to Clyde Barrow. So Clyde, let's go ahead and talk about him real fast. He was born into a really large close-knit family. He was the sixth of eight children with a very poor family in Texas. They were a farming family, and they lived in a small town until the drought of the 1920s brought them to the bigger city, which is just outside of West Dallas, where Bonnie was. And they actually ended up living kind of in the slums of a like a tent city just outside of the town. And this is where Clyde would get into a lot of trouble running around with his older brother, Buck. And he does also drop out at 16 when they moved from the farm to the city. He drops out of school then as well. And uh, when he was growing up, he had a few things happen to him. So his older sister, Nell, really loved him so much that when he was a tiny baby, she just hugged him and hugged him and hugged him. And it was reported that he turned purple and he had to be <laughs> resuscitated. Okay. So an oxic brain injury. And she also didn't get any um, punishment for it. And there was another time where, um, you know, a lot of the care and watching of the children was put on the older children. And uh, Nell, his older sister, was supposed to be watching them and they were swimming and he basically drowned. <laughs> he had to be pulled out and he was blue again. Okay. And then it goes into some of the instances of violence. So it was reported that at a young age, Clyde was witnessed by neighbors doing acts of animal cruelty mm. at a very young age. So some of the things he would do, you could skip forward in this part if you don't like to hear um, stories about this, go ahead and skip about 20 seconds forward, but he would snap a bird's wings just to watch it struggle. Oh. He was known to choke chickens and watch their slow deaths. Okay, so that would be a symptom of conduct disorder. Um, and conduct disorder, to kind of put it simply, is a child or adolescent version of antisocial personality disorder. So there was early signs um, of this antisocial presentation early in his life. But again, it goes back to early childhood trauma often. Um, I wonder what kind of dis – mom was not a disciplinarian. No, they, they were very tired. They were, they had to work very hard just to make very little. They had a lot of children. They are very tired. They would often send the siblings – they would split the siblings up and send them away for long periods of time to stay with other aunts and uncles. And I think it wasn't until their father – decided they had to give up farming life during the drought that they were actually all reunited. Um, but I wonder what kind of disciplinarian was dad? So sometimes when you have parents on two different pages with, with discipline, one is much less of a disciplinarian because they feel bad or trying to make up for the other parent, right? Over disciplining. Um, so I wonder if there was any sort of that going on as well, because given the severity of Applied symptoms with his conduct disorder early on and then antisocial personality. I feel like there's some pretty big T trauma early on in life. And to clarify that, the antisocial personality disorder, mm -hmm. I got it right? Okay. That was what was originally called as a psychopath. And it's since we don't use that term anymore. Yes. So it's been up it was updated in the DSM three. Um, and there's some slight subtle differences based, like they didn't just change the name of it. There's some subtle mm -hmm. differences, but essentially that diagnosis kind of, um, replaced the psychopath. Gotcha. Just to catch, catch y'all up if you didn't hear about that. So, you know, his family had to live under their wagon for a long time, like a few months until they had enough money to even save up for a tent. And then his father eventually went on to save enough to buy a filling station, so a gas station. So then they got kind of embedded into the community, and that's how they grew to know a lot of people from that time. So, you know, it does make sense because he had things set up 
to go on and if he wanted to work for his dad. But it's it's like his aspirations were always just out of reach. We're always he reminds me a lot of um, if you're familiar with the great Gatsby, how James Gats wants to turn into Jay Gatsby. It's I know I'm turning into teacher mode, but I just he totally reminds me of someone who who envisions their life as something out of reach and they'll never be able to reach it. So like Bonnie Clyde, like I said, dropped out of school. But at one time, you know, he actually aspired to be a musician. And he played the guitar and the saxophone until he succumbed to a life of petty crime alongside Big Brother Buck. And that quickly escalated to auto theft and armed robberies, but no physical injuries of other people that were reported until Eastham Prison Farm when he did kill his rapist, as we discussed in parts one and two. And that, Joe, brings us back to January 5th, 1930 in West Dallas when boy Clyde Barrow meets girl Bonnie Parker over hot chocolate, standing in a kitchen full of mutual friends, yet only seeing each other, and a monster duo is birthed. And this podcast was dedicated in memory to the 12 victims of the Bonnie and Clyde gang. Thank you very much for joining us for parts one, part two, and this bonus episode, part three. This is True Crime and Headlines, a production of Ann Lee Audio House, LLC. I'm Jules. I'm Joe. Thank you so much for being here. You are loved, you are wanted, and you are needed for our next episode in two weeks. Join us then. Clyde Barrow was read by Joseph Baron, and Bonnie Parker was read by Sarah Parrish. Podcaster. Right too.